All right, so for this lecture, we'll be going over the history of family. Um, we'll talk about migration patterns, all kinds of things. So let's kind of dive into how families have structured and how they've changed. So in today's lecture, we'll be going over the history of families, but more specifically, we'll learn how families, um, their structures and functions have changed over the last several decades. We'll also specifically be learning about American families, but we'll also learn about how families of various ethnic backgrounds um, and how their histories and migration to the US has influenced their family dynamics. We'll also learn about sexual identities and how the increased representation and understanding of sexual identities has impacted families. Overall though, we'll cover historical and social changes and how they influence families. So let's dive in. So our first family that we'll be going over is the American Indian family. And that is a term that is often used for a subset of original indigenous people who settled in North America thousands of years before European colonizers came to the continent. Other terms for this group are First Nations people, indigenous people, um, and Native American but our textbook refers to them as American Indians. So for the sake of ease, uh, we'll be using that term for this lecture. Most American Indians lived in tribal societies that were based on lineage, which are kinship groups in which people trace their descent either through the father's line or the mother's line, but not both. If the descent is traced through the father's line, it's a patrilineal lineage. If it's traced through the mother's line, it's a matrilineal lineage. Lineages are often defined by those who um, are related and who share resources and land. For example, if you're using a patrilineal line, which is what we often use, um, if a woman marries a man in a different tribe or different family, uh, she tends to leave behind her lineage to join another and the man that she marries stays in the same lineage and the land that he grew up on. So she kind of has to uproot and join this new family. And he kind of gets to stay where he is. Both patrilineal and matrilineal tribes existed and often uh, times related li lineages were organized to create larger tribes that would pull resources and govern themselves. In a matrilineal tribe, a person would trace their line through their mother's line and their connections to their mother's family were much stronger with the father's family. So more specifically, the father who married into the matrilineal tribe was considered a guest of the tribe, and therefore um, he had less influence on the children being raised in, within the tribe. So oftentimes it would be the mother's or the maternal grandmother, grandfather or the maternal uncle that would have much more of an influence on the child than the biological father. And these tribes, uh, once a boy reached puberty, he would leave to marry into another tribe, but girls would stay with their tribe and stay in their matrilineal home, so they wouldn't have to move. Oftentimes, marriages between tribes would increase alliances and create um, access to resources, as well as strengthen the social order for these tribes. As a result, marriages were often arranged by elders from each uh, partner's lineage, so they would negotiate that the kind of people who ran the tribe or governed over the tribe would influence or negotiate that marriage. It should be noted that many tribes experienced major losses through genocide, disease, and colonization. Later in American history, um, American Indian children were forcefully removed from their homes and taken to what were called residential schools that would strip them of their culture and heritage in an effort to make them more civilized or assimilate them to American um, culture. As a result, many children and families were separated and torn apart, which led to much of their culture and heritage being ripped away as well, which is why um, today we'll see, you know, strong um, ties to Native American history or ties to their culture now being passed on to children because that was lost um, earlier on. So now a lot of American Indian families will reinforce American Indian culture within their children because it was stripped away so long ago too. The next family we'll cover are the European colonists and European colonists were organized at, 
organized into much smaller family units. There were conjugal families, which included the husband, the wife, and the children that they have. And then the larger family unit uh, would be considered the extended family, which is all members of the conjugal family, plus any other relatives that were present in the household, like grandparents or uncles and aunts. Families within colonies were expected to provide services or goods that would benefit the larger community. So some adults would have specialized knowledge on how to care for the sick, some community members would be asked to serve as judges if any petty crimes occurred within the community. Orphans were cared for by relatives or family friends and community members and elders were cared for by their children and again any community members that could take them on. And families in need would often be taken care of or sponsored by wealthy community members. Children were also expected to know how to read and have basic education which was done by family members and not in schoolhouses. So in today's terms, we would call that homeschooling. So there wasn't like a public setting where education was taught. All of these services were often carried out within a family home and they weren't left to institutions or businesses to manage. As a result, families were not considered private but were considered a public good that were necessary for the society to function. Families were actually very diverse among colonists because the death rate was so high among colonists, widows and widowers would often marry someone else in order to help them raise any children that they had with their first spouse and keep the home kind of running, which led to increases in step families. Orphans were also adopted by other family members or community members. Informal marriages were very common, um, and those were just any marriages that weren't recognized by the church. And that was pretty much the common type of marriage people would have. Um, in the 19th and 20th century, though, families became um, less diverse as governments began to enforce and require uh, marriage licenses and death rates began to drop. So before marriage license and the government kind of came in and said, this is how we're going to do marriage, informal marriages was the way that you would go about getting married. Okay. The structure of family and what the function of family was shifted after the American Revolution, and there are four key ways in which families change. So first, people were more likely to marry for love and affection than for custom, cultural norms, or political reasons. Uh, before, marriage was often decided by the families of the bride and groom and used to increase economic stability, social status, or benefit both families. Uh, but now, most couples were choosing to marry for love, which allowed um, for couples to have more choice in who they had as a lifelong partner. Although romantic love was part of the equation, most couples were still very careful in choosing a partner. Um, they all wanted someone who's going to be dependable and financially stable. The primary role of the wife was to care for the children and maintain the home, while men were expected to go out into the world, creating that breadwinner, homemaker dynamic that we discussed in our first, first lecture. Before, both partners would work to maintain their land, manage their home, and raise their children. But as commercial capitalism emerged, men were now having to leave the home to get jobs outside um, and in the world to make a living. As a result, women were left at home to manage the day-to-day -day caretaking tasks, both with the children and with the home. This led um, to key differences between men and women and how they were perceived. Um, the men's spheres, which was their world's perspective, um, were governed by rough, rough ethic, the rough ethics of capitalism and making it out on top while women's spheres were considered to be more morally pure um, in a place where a man could go at the end of the day to feel safe and renewed after working um, in this kind of what's it called? Um, concrete jungle kind of environment. So this idea of having separate spheres made women the moral gatekeepers of their family and placed them in charge of the children and the husband's morality and glamorized their domestic role in the home. In reality, these new roles led women to be dependent on their partner and tended to limit their worldviews and purpose. Another major change was the shift in parenting. So children were no longer needed to support the family farm or an essential economic resource. 
Um, now couples could elect to have children and parents tended to be much more loving and affectionate with their children. This also led to decreases in the number of children each family had because they no longer needed um, children to help support the fa family financially. It should be noted that these trends were typically only found among urban and middle-class families. Uh, for low-income families, the dynamics were different, but little is known about them because much of the research tends to focus on white middle-class families. Obviously, um, Europeans were not the only ones to immigrate to the United States. Um, Africans were forcefully taken from their country as of origin and brought to the United States to be sold as slaves. Mexicans immigrated to the Southwest in search of more land uh, for their cattle and their farm animals and to create more you know, product on their farms. Asian immigrants uh, moved here to work on the railroads and other enterprises um, and how these groups came to America ultimately influenced their dyna family dynamics for the future. So up until the 1970s, most historians thought that the oppression of slavery had destroyed most of the culture for African slaves. And um, that's kind of how they thought about families as well. So slavery uprooted people from their countries of origin, broke up families through slave trade um, and left parents, specifically men, um, or kept parents, specifically the men from protecting their families. Oftentimes slave owners would separate husbands from their wives and children and families could be separated at any time by the slave owner because marriage among slaves or those informal marriages uh, weren't considered legally binding by the slave owners. As a result, um, families took on many forms, including marriage-based, single parents, and multi-generational families. But the most common form of family that we would see among the slave population was a mother and child without any other relatives, because that's how the slave owner would split them up. Although families struggled to stay together, many families would find ways to stay connected or at least be aware of where other families may be located so that they could potentially reconnect in the future. After the Civil War, it was common for both men and women to work and Black women rarely remained in the home to solely raise the children and manage the home, which was not seen among middle-class white women. Because Black men were paid significantly less than white, than white men, Black women would work to help provide for their families, creating that dual income type of family. Black women were also more likely to live without a partner um, and be single mothers, but that's due to the high rates of mor mortality among Black men, which left 42% of Black women as widows. Some of these trends continue today. For example, both Black men and women make significantly less money when compared to white men, which requires more families to be dual income. Mexicans originally settled in Southwest America in the early 19th century in order to obtain more land. Early settlers were made up of elite land owning families or farm laborers. Among the wealthy landowners, they would arrange their children's marriages and celebrate with elaborate feasts and ceremonies. Among laborers, which made up most of the settlers, they tended to be what's called mestizos, which I may or may not be pronouncing cor correctly which are people whose ancestors were both Spanish settlers and Native Americans from Mexico. Uh, there is evidence that they held informal weddings, often to evade parents and families influence over who they would marry. They would also uphold a tradition knows, known as, I'm so sorry if I butcher this, com, combadrazos, I'm so sorry, um, which is when a godparent who is usually a wealthy or influential person outside of the family would be chosen um, for a child. Usually the godparent would provide for the child or help them find a job later in life. After a series, a series of wars and revolts, Mexican settlers lost their land to the U.S. troops and moved to segregated neighborhoods in the cities that the Americans established. After World War II, Mexican immigrants began to move to the U.S. to earn money to send back to their families in Mexico. And today, 63% of all Americans identify as Hispanic um, or of Mexican descent. Um, 
Uh, Chinese immigrants originally began to arrive uh, during the California gold rush and were later hired to work on the railroads in the Southwest. Most of the immigrants were originally men and often left their wives behind in China. Uh, Chinese immigration in the US slowed after the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was passed. In the 1880s, there was also an increase of Japanese immigrants as they arrived to Hawaii and the mainland. Japanese immigrants also faced discrimination, especially during World War II, uh, when Americans uh, questioned Japanese Americans' loyalty to the US and placed them in internment camps. Uh, and once Japanese families were released from these internment camps after World War II, many had lost their businesses and homes, new people had moved into their homes, um, some neighbors would try to maintain their homes or businesses, but that was really hard to do. Um, where I grew up, we actually had an internment camp like 45 minutes outside of my town. Um, and our fairgrounds were actually where Japanese families were taken and then buses would arrive and then shuttle them off to the internment camp. And usually these internment camps were out in California deserts. Um, it was horrific and if anyone is ever interested about that history I can probably provide resources for you I learned a lot about this when I was in school because I grew up in California and this was a major part of our history that we were taught so it was awful in general though Asian immigrants um, immigration was modest until Congress passed the 1965 Immigration Act, which put an end to restriction on Asian immigration, which had lasted up until about 1882. When we look at family dynamics among Asian immigrant families, there are some key differences when we compare them to European American families. So first parents tend to hold more authority in the family and often choose who their parents, will, or not their parents, their children will marry and when. Kinship is also patrilineal, meaning that sons will stay in their father's homes and daughters will leave their families of origin to move in with their in-laws. Children were also expected to care for their parents um, and no obligation was considered more important than caring for your family, specifically your elderly parents. After World War II though, this began to shift as more Asian immigrants were choosing to marry for love and would often go against their parents' wishes. Um, many would argue that historically sexual identities were irrelevant or didn't exist. Historians, though, have found many erotic letters between men and their male counterparts, as well as females and their female friends. And oftentimes it would be say that they were just like really good buddies um, or that they were roommates, things like that. Um, but it should be noted that although same sex attraction did exist, and has always existed, uh, there just likely wasn't a name for it at the time. So for example, two women who lived together their whole lives and shared a bed and who were inseparable today would probably be considered romantic partners. But again, in the early 18th and 19th century, they would be considered spinsters who were roommates. Um, the best known historical account of same-sex in same -sex intimacy comes from Smith and Rosenberger's study known as the female world of love and ritual. So in this study, Smith Rosenberger explored the emotional bonds between middle-class women. In the study, it was found that female friendships were loving and sensual, but not necessarily sexual. As sexual acts did not define the relationship, which created again, more flexibility in regard to how these bonds were formed. During this time, there weren't terms like homosexual or heterosexual or same-sex attraction, things like that but rather sexual acts were divided into socially approved versus socially disapproved. So socially approved sexual acts included sexual intercourse within the confines of marriage, often in moderation, um, and mostly to have children and not for the sake of pleasure. Socially disapproved acts included same um, gendered sex, masturbation, and oral sex, regardless of the gender of the partners that were engaging in the oral sex. If anyone engaged in these socially disapproved acts, they were often chastised or had to engage in these acts very privately. It wasn't until later that the concept of sexual identity emerged. However, in the late 19th century, people who identified as having same-sex attraction were often persecuted or diagnosed with mental health issues. 
while people who were heterosexual were considered normal and healthy. Um, this idea continued until about 1973, which is when the American Psychiatric Association finally removed same-sex attraction uh, from the list of mental disorders. However, stigmatization continued on and still occurs to this day, but representation is increasing as same-sex marriages have been um, legalized and more present in the media and families are beginning to diversify or be more open as a result. And we'll go over this more when we like later on in the semester, but this just provides us with some historical context. So in the 1900s, specifically around the 1920s, there was an increase in premarital sex, a drop in the birth rate and increased divorce rates across the country. Women were becoming more dependent financially as they began to enter the workforce and also birth control was more widely accessible. Uh, not the pill, but just knowledge about healthcare, access to condoms, things like that was becoming more accessible. During this time, men and women began to require more out of their relationships. Romantic love, companionship, and happiness were now the foundations for marriage rather than focusing on economic prospects or a sense of duty. By defining marriage and family through more emotional terms, this led to that shift towards a more private family. Rather than determining satisfaction and success on how well you did your family role, what was more important was the relationship that you had with your family members. That emotional connection was more important rather than the goods that you provided for the community. Families were also less dominant in the public spheres as children began to get a public education in schools and as more services became dependent on companies and institutions. As the industrial revolution allowed for more economic freedom and job opportunities, individualism also began to rise. And we talked about that in lecture one. People were no longer living in these multi-generational homes anymore, but they were beginning to shift more towards a private life away from extended family and often choosing to live on their own or living in different cities away from family. Overall, there was a shift in how couples understood marriage and people were allowed more choice in their public private lives as a result. So during the Great Depression, uh, families experienced intense economic hardships that changed the dynamics. First, fathers began to lose authority as the head of household since he was typically no longer able to provide, um, provide for the family or the children. And as a result, the children in particular teens were expected to get jobs in order to help out the family financially. Because of the economic hardships, most young couples and adults were waiting to marry and have children. Some couples um, were never able to have children because of the delays in childbearing, which led to a significant decrease in children being born during this time. The birth rate actually hit an all-time low during this period. And although couples would delay marriage, many children and young adults during this time did still want to marry and highly valued marriage but it wasn't an option because the finances were so terrible and it wasn't financially feasible to get married and have a child. However, after World War II, there was a baby boom in which a large number of children that were born and the country's birth um, rate increased exponentially after this huge drop because of the Great Depression. On average, women would have slightly more than three children in their families. But, you know, what led to the baby boom? After World War II, there was an increase in job prospects and a cultural emphasis on marriage and children, especially because there was that big drop in marriage rates and in childbearing rates. Uh, jobs specifically um, offered a lot better pay during this time. And there was an abundance of jobs in the U.S. And since there was a limited workforce, due to the low birth rates from the Great Depression, it was easy for people to get a job. As a result, men were able to um, go to work and earn enough income to support a really large family just on one singular income. This produced the breadwinner and homemaker family again, which allowed men to work and provide for their families and women were able to stay home and care for their children. 
Additionally, the government supported this dynamic by granting veterans of World War II with low interest mortgages so that they could purchase their homes. So a lot of people were able to become homeowners and get that financial freedom in that way, which is why when people, maybe older adults say like, oh, why don't you own a home? Like it's so easy. It's because it, they had a much easier time of being able to do that. And the government supported them through that. Although the breadwinner and homemaker dynamic was fairly common, most women would go back to work once their children were in school and they would often take on caregiving jobs um, that provided little income. So jobs like um, being a teacher, nanny, um, secretary, things like that. Mothers would also encourage their daughters during this time to wait to marry and instead want them to go for higher education or professional careers. Although motherhood and homemaking was um, common during this time, individual pursuits were also encouraged by some. All right. Oh, whoops, went too far. All right. At the height of the baby boom, the birth rate took a huge dive and reached an all-time low in the 1970s. Well, not an all-time low, not as bad as the Great Depression. Um, but during this time, the birth control pill was introduced and became widely accessible to women. Men and women were marrying later in life too and increased the marriage age to late 20s rather than early 20s. Um, which is what previous generations would often marry at. Um, women were also more likely to work outside of the home, even if they did marry and have children. So living by yourself became more common during this time. Before, most people left their parents' homes only after they had gotten married. But during this time, people were moving out in their early 20s to live alone or moving out to go away someplace else for college cohabitation or the sharing of a household by unmarried persons in a sexual relationship also began to rise during this time and became more socially acceptable. Rises in cohabitation then led to rises in non-marital births. The divorce rate also doubled during this time. So now about half of all marriages will end in divorce, but this does vary, does vary based off education levels. As a result, children were less likely to live in a home with both parents. Okay. When we understand how historical events and cultural moments affect the family, we need to take an approach known as the life course perspective. This perspective is common in family science because it allows for researchers to understand the nuance of historical events and cultural movements and how they can shape a person's life over time. We've used this perspective throughout this lecture as we've learned about how different historical points shape the birth rates, the rates of marriage, and the roles of family members. We can also apply this perspective to today's culture and shifts in family. So currently we are experiencing what is considered a new life stage known as emerging adulthood, which some of you may have heard of. Emerging adulthood is a period between the mid-teens, so about 15, typically older, around high school age, 17, 18, um, is considered emerging adult, um, to about the age of 30, in which individuals are finishing their education, entering the workforce, and beginning to build their own families. So this kind of longer period of going into adulthood or becoming fully independent adult. Today's emerging adults tend to delay marriage and childbearing because as many of us probably know the job market isn't great and most jobs require high educational attainment in order to get a decent pay. Um, so because of these shifts, education is becoming much more important and more people are enrolling in graduate school or um, delay, and as a result, result delaying other milestones like marriage, childbearing, things like that. This has led to an increase of young adults holding back on marriage and family building and has led to an increase in cohabitation rates or non-marital childbearing. Um, people are also delaying marriage because as I mentioned, the job market is terrible and most people do consider marriage um, as a marker of economic success. So having a low paying job also tends to keep people from marrying as well. Overall, the traditional markers of full adulthood are being delayed or what, what, how we understand adulthood is also being shifted.
Um, something that we were not able to cover earlier in this lecture is LGBTQ adults and their families. So most research on queer individuals throughout the last several decades is limited due to prejudice and most queer people having to remain closeted for their own safety. However, more research on queer families and individuals is becoming available, but it's coming along a bit slowly. I do have some friends who do research on these types of families and these types of relationships. So if anyone is interested, I can provide resources. Uh, but I do wanna note that we weren't able to cover that a lot, but that's because the research is limited and we're catching up. As a wrap up though, I want us to consider how historical contexts are going to affect each person's understanding of family. We can also consider the larger history, but we'll also need to look at personal histories and experiences as well. We'll also learn a lot about history and how that impacts our understandings, but we also need to see what we're missing in the history as well. All right, that's it for our lecture for today. So let's move on to lecture three.